man, listen, I got to tell you, I've been up since 3 o'clock this morning because I'm so excited about this word. <laughs> I know you don't know what's coming, but I do. <laughs> and oh my gosh. Whew. Turn in your Bibles today to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians, this is the letter of Paul to the Colossians. If you, if you don't know where that's at, find Galatians, turn to Ephesians, find Philippians, then you'll find Colossians. If you go too far, then you'll be in Thessalonians. So make a left and come back. The letter to the Colossians chapter 1. In verse 15, is it all right today if I preach just a little bit? Is it all right today if I just preach a simple message on the lordship of Jesus Christ and just, just simply proclaim him as Lord? Is that all right if I do that? Amen. Well, here it is, verse 15. Paul is writing, and he says, he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him, that is, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he, that is, Jesus is before all things, and in him, that is Jesus, all things hold together, and he, that is Jesus, thank you Kathy, you're listening, I don't know about everybody else, but Jesus is the head of the body, the church, and he that is, Jesus. is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he, that is Jesus, he might be preeminent or supreme. The Greek word is proteo, first place, supreme, exalted, the highest ranking, the champion, the greatest, the goat. If we were writing this scripture today, we would simply say, Jesus is the boss and he is Lord. Woo! Now, Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit and your anointing to teach us everything that we need to know. Anoint our ears to listen, anoint our hearts to obey. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. Who are we talking about today? Woo, you're ready, I can tell. Well, listen to me. There are many people down through the years that have had the title known as the boss. For example, this guy right here. Some of you know who he is. Come on, work with me online. There he is. Bruce Springsteen, the boss. Little, little Bruce Springsteen trivia for you today. I bet you didn't know you were going to come to New Life and learn about Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> Only at New Life. Bruce Springsteen got his title, The Boss, not because of his rock star fame, but because when the, when the, when the uh, band would go out on tour, they would come back from every night playing, and they would come back to the hotel room, and every single night, Bruce Springsteen beat his band in a game of Monopoly, and the E Street Band gave Bruce the title, The Boss. Bet you didn't know that. Hallelujah. <laughs> let, me let me show you somebody else who's known as The Boss. Some of you know this lady, the soul singer, Diana Ross. She was known as The Boss. How did she get her title? Her title came from her group called the Supremes. First of all, she was known as somebody that was very, very hard to work for. 
Secondly, she was known as somebody who was really, really tough when she was negotiating contracts for her gigs. And so they gave her the name called The Boss. There are other people down through the years that you may or may not have heard about that carry the title The Boss. People like this lady here, the rapper Lachelle Marie Laws. Never heard of her. Not one time, but she's known as the boss. Some of you may have heard of Sasha Banks, the pro wrestler. How about this guy here, Paul Castellano? Some of you from Youngstown, you know who Paul Castellano is. He was in the 70s, the New York mob boss known as the boss of all bosses. Don't mess with Paul Castellano. (laughs) You might get hurt. And of course, there's the comedian show, the comedy show that we've all heard about. Who's the boss? Right. And I'm sure there's a lot of others. But I want to talk to you today about maybe someone you've never heard of before that Liz and I learned about a few weeks ago when we were in Alberta, Canada. We learned when we, when he, when we read about this thing, <laughs> we, I, right away I said, I'm going to use him as a sermon illustration. I couldn't let it go. And then Liz gave me the three points for the message today. No, she didn't do that. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you today to the boss. (laughs) Grizzly bear. Let me give you a few facts about the boss, and I'm not making these things up. Forest rangers call him Bear 122, the boss. He's the boss of Banff, Canada. He is believed to be around 25 years old. He's the most famous bear in Canada. He's one of the largest grizzly bears in Banff National Park, weighing in at 650 pounds. Put his picture back up there, please. He is believed to have fathered 70% of other bears in Banff. He is one bad bear. (laughs) He has actually been seen eating smaller bears. True. But he is also one resilient tough bear. True fact. He has been hit by a train twice and survived. He has several chunks of flesh taken out of his ears. He has scars and wounds from other bear fights, but he has never lost a battle. He is the boss. Now, I know you know where I'm going with this message, so I'm just going to go ahead and take you there today because I didn't come to talk to you about a rock star. I didn't come to talk to you about a soul singer. I'm not going to waste your time today talking about a rapper, a wrestler, a mob boss, or a grizzly bear, but I came today to tell you about capital B, the boss. I came today to announce to the powers of hell and to proclaim to the prince of darkness who the capital B boss really is. He's the greatest of all time. He's the goat. He's the undefeated, undisputed champion of the world. He is the boss. His name is Jesus, the Son of the living God. Give him a praise. Hallelujah. Woo! The boss! 
I'm telling you today, listen to me. He's got some wounds on his body. He's got some scars in his hands. They nailed him to a cross. They put him in a tomb. But on the third day, the boss got up out of the tomb and he's alive with resurrection power. If you know the boss, get up on your feet. Give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. The boss. He's the boss. Hallelujah. Come on and give him the glory. He's in charge. He's in control. Woo! I'm talking about the Prince of Peace. The first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's the breath in my lungs. He's the bread of life. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the boss of all bosses. Shout! Hello! I'm talking about the boss. Everybody say Jesus. Woo, glory. Forgive me for getting just a little bit passionate about the boss. There's nobody like him, friend. He'll never let you down. He's the undefeated, undisputed champion. Kick the devil in the face. He is Lord of all. You looking for a quiet church, you came to the wrong place. There are plenty of churches in this community. If you want a funeral, you can go find one. But this is a church that is alive with resurrection power. I'm talking about the boss. Show. I'm on the attack this morning. I'm attacking some devils today. You religious devil, get the heck out of here. Mm. Hallelujah! The boss! Mm. Settle down, Dave. Take a drink. My watch don't work. What's yours say? I don't care. Daisy Fitch told me a long time ago, quit worrying about the clock. When you're done, when you're done, you can go ahead and get up and leave. I'll still be right here. Mm. I didn't know if that was a mosquito or what that was. The boss. Mm. Jesus. My God. Where was I at? Mm. Mm. That's right. I was just declaring Jesus is Lord. So in our text today, the Apostle Paul is describing the superiority, the preeminence of Christ. And it's important for us to understand the context in which Paul pins his letter to the Colossian believers. Because much like our day, the prevailing philosophy or thought in the known world at that time was called Gnosticism. Now listen to this. There's a lot about Gnosticism that we we still don't understand, but basically it was the belief 
that anybody could get to God any way that they chose. That there was a God, but he was this ethereal being that, that, that had no matter to him. You could not personally know him. And, and, and the Gnostics wanted Christianity to merely become just another philosophy or religion mixed in with all of the others. Does that sound familiar? Gnostics had a strange belief that all material matter, all physical matter was evil and only the invisible or only the spiritual was good. Therefore, guess what they did? They denied that Jesus Christ came as the incarnate Son of God. That's heresy. Uh, they denied the humanity of Jesus. They, they would say that, the only, that only a supernatural force could have created the universe, but not God himself because God could not touch the physical or the evil. Are you following the train of thought here? Because along comes the apostle Paul, and what does he do in verse 15, in, in Colossians 1.15, he says that he, Jesus, watch this, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, now don't let the word firstborn confuse you or throw you. It simply means first in position or kind, the firstborn of a new humanity which will be glorified. Oh, now, now watch, watch now. The first point that Paul is making and that we are making to you today is this. Jesus is the boss of his creation. Jesus is the Lord. He's the boss of his creation. And I want you to notice that there are two things that Paul tells us that make Jesus the Lord or the boss of his creation in verse 15 and 16. He says, first of all, he is God wrapped in flesh. That's who Jesus is. The theological phrase is, he is the incarnate son of God. Let me break this down for you. The word of God says in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. The word image means a manifestation of the exact representation of another. It also means a portrait, if you will. So when Jesus came to this earth, he came to show us a portrait of his father in heaven because God is invisible and no one can see the glory of God in his fullness and survive. So Jesus, who is God, took upon the likeness of human flesh, came to this earth and basically said this, do you want to see God? Then look at me. That's what Jesus was saying. You want to see what the invisible God will do in any given situation? Watch me and I'll show you. Because if you have seen me, Jesus says, you will have seen a manifestation of the invisible God. Jesus is the boss of creation because he is God wrapped in human flesh. Hallelujah. Secondly, Jesus is the boss of his creation. Watch this now because he holds all things together. Paul tells us that in verse 16, for by him, that is to say by Jesus, all things 
were created in heaven and on earth. Notice, visible and invisible. Things that you can see and things that you cannot see. Thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. Watch this. And in him, in Jesus, all things hold together. You say, well, what keeps the planets in alignment? What keeps the stars from crashing to the earth? What keeps the sun from burning us up or being too far from freezing us out? No, 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 friend. It's not what, it's who. Who keeps the universe held together? His name is Jesus, and he is the boss of his creation. Hallelujah. Listen to this, every visible and invisible thing was spoken into existence by our Christ. Every rock, every river, every plant, every animal, every person, every government, come on, every angel, every neutron, proton, every atom, every authority, every throne, if it exists, he made it. I'm simply reminding you today that Jesus is the boss of his creation. He stepped out of nowhere onto nothing and spoke it all into existence. Don't tell me today that he can't hold your life together. Don't tell me today he can't hold your marriage together. Don't tell me today he can't hold your children together. He's the one who holds it all together. He's the boss of his creation and all heaven declares his glory. Let's give him a praise today. Hallelujah. All creation shouts his praise. Not only is he the boss of creation, but he is the boss of his church. Paul simply says in verse 18, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He's the boss. He's the Lord of the church. Now, I don't know about you, but in my position, let me give you two things that have set me free from being overly anxious or, or fearful or filled with anxiety, especially as a pastor of a church. Now, these will apply to you also. And it has everything to do with being Jesus being the boss of his church. Watch this. Since Jesus is the boss of his church, that means, first of all, he's the builder. I said he is the builder. He's the divine architect of this thing that we call the church, the body of Christ. For he said, upon this rock, I, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You see, friend, he started the church, not you, not me. He's the author of it. He's the owner of it. He's the landlord. He has the title deed. He paid for it by his blood, and it's his church. What does that mean to us? Well, you've heard me talk about this before, but it simply means this. Listen, this ought to set you free. It simply means that he requires from us, get ready for a big word, Synergistic participation. Everyone cooperating together, participating together. Here's what it means. It means I don't have to build his church. I just have to participate and cooperate with the builder. <laughs> we just have to submit to his authority and his strategy. 
We simply have to follow the architectural and blueprint plans that he has given us on how to build his church. It means, catch this, we do, we, or we exist to serve him. He doesn't exist to serve us. That's a big one. It means if we're going to live in his house, being part of his church, we have to follow his ways and be governed by his decrees because he is the builder. Since Jesus is the boss of his church, it not only means, watch this, he's not only the builder, he's the brains. Thank God. He's the brains. Paul says it like this. He's the head. He's the head of the body. And since he is the head, that means we are not the brains. He is the brains. Now, let me just say this to you real quick. Listen. If you separate the body from the head, you no longer have a living organism. You have a dead corpse. Uh, let, me, let me say that again for some of you seasonal Christians. If you separate the body from the head, you no longer have a living organism. You have a dead corpse and that's what we have in much of America today when it comes to church we don't have living churches we have dead corpses that have the appearance of a church but when you step inside and look closer all you see is a tomb filled with dead man's bones where there's no life there's no joy there's no praise there's no power there's no prayer why because they have separated themselves from the head and decided to do it their own way this is not burger king you can't have it your way. You got to go his way. He's the head. God forbid that we ever think we're smart enough to be the brains of the church. None of us are. That's why we got to seek God in prayer. We got to keep in step with what the Spirit of God is saying to this church. And if we ever get out of keeping in step with the Spirit and we get off on our own thing, we're destroyed. We can have a name Assemblies of God on the outside. You can have the name Pentecostal on the outside, but you got to stay connected to the head to have the power of God. Hallelujah. Sometimes his brain doesn't work like, oh my gosh. Sometimes his brain doesn't work like our brain. Sometimes his brain says, take a step of faith and jump out into the water when you don't know how it's gonna go. Your brain says, I can't do that. His brain says, you better do that if you want the blessing. Come on, somebody. He's the brain. He's the builder. He's the brain. I'm telling you today, Jesus is the boss of his church. Thirdly, last of all, Jesus is the boss of his children. He's the boss of creation. He's the boss of the church. And he is the boss of his children. <laughs> Look at verse 19. Paul goes on to say, for in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, that is Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether they're on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now that just hit me like a lightning bolt right there. When Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, 
Not only did things happen on earth, but there were some things happening in heaven. I don't have time to preach that. One day I will. Let's read on. And he goes on and he says, watch this now. And you, yeah, you, you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Why? In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Let me just stop there and say, it's Jesus's job to present us holy and blameless and above reproach to the Father. It's not our job, it's Jesus' job. That's what he does when you bow a knee at an altar and say yes to Jesus. It's his job to present you to the Father, holy, blameless, and above reproach. I don't know about you, but that sets me free from a religion of dead works. Woo, we got a bunch of legalists in the crowd. I can feel it right here. Well, don't I have to do something? Yeah, you do. It's called synergistic participation. Just cooperate with God. Whew. Read on. If indeed you continue in the faith, that's all you got to do. Stay in the game, friend. Don't give up. Don't give up on days that you're unholy. Don't give up on days when you missed it and you sinned. Don't give up on days when you said something you shouldn't have said or done something you shouldn't have done. Don't give up. Stay in the faith. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast. Boy, we need some of that today. My God. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. You got to stay in the game. Don't give up. Be stable. Don't be in one day and out the next. He's got your back, friend. He'll present you to the Father holy and blameless and without reproach if you'll stay in the game. Ooh, that's for somebody today. If you will not shift from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Well, what is the hope of the gospel that we have heard? Glad you ask. First of all, he redeemed us. That's the hope of the gospel that we have heard. He redeemed us. The word redemption means this, watch this. The release of people or property that has been bound through the payment of a redemption price. Let me say that again. It means redemption, the release of a property or a person that has been bound but set free through a redemption price. Ugh. Because God is a holy God, and it is against his nature, and it would be unjust to allow any of us to be in his presence or in his heaven. It would be unjust for him to allow any of us because we've all sinned and we've fallen short of his standard of perfection. Not one of you could come close. I don't care if your name is Billy Icorn and you are the sweetest person. I love Billy. <laughs> I don't care if you've been coming to church all your life and you are Mr. Goody Two Shoes. I don't care. You have no right and it would be unjust for God to let you into heaven. So that means you are bound. You are bound by your sin. There's nothing you can do to set yourself free. So what does God do? He requires a redemption payment for humanity's sin. 
Are you with me? This is where it gets real interesting. Now enter split lip. There he is. Friend, I am not making this up. That is the boss's rival. Let me give you a few facts about Split Lip. He is known by the forest rangers as Bear 136. In 2015, he made the news for eating a smaller grizzly bear who was one-third his size. He's a mean bear. The boss and Split Lip have been chasing and battling each, over, uh, battling each other over territory many times. They call him Split Lip because you guessed it, the boss gave him a Split Lip. Listen to this. Those who've been encountered Split Lip, they say he is known for what is called a bluff charge. A bluff charge. What, what is a bluff charge? <laughs> it's when a bear starts to run at you and then he backs off. He's merely trying to intimidate and put fear in you. That's where they tell you that when a grizzly bear charges you, just lay down and play dead. Not this guy. <laughs> Not this guy. Because if you've ever seen me run, I'm like Superman, man. I'm faster than a speeding bullet. I run like a locomotive train, man. I'm not playing dead for any bear. <laughs> Split lip. <laughs> That's the facts on Grizzly Bear 136. But can I tell you some facts? about someone else that most of us that are believers have encountered at some point in our lives. And I'm talking about that sinister enemy called the devil. His name could be called Split Lip because he's the rival of our boss, Jesus. He is our sinister adversary who tries to bluff us with a charge and intimidate us with his fear and scare tactics and deception. And he certainly has a split lip because everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. Jesus said he is the father of lies and there is no truth in him. He will try to tell you there's no hope for you. He will try to tell you there's no peace for your life. There's no joy. You're not worthy enough. You're not good enough. You're not going to make it. You're going under. Listen, if he ever starts talking to you and running towards you, please, I beg you, don't play dead. <laughs> just, yeah, just. Tell him, hold on a second, devil. I got to go talk to the boss. Mm. James 4, 7 says, if I submit myself to God and resist the devil, he's the one that's got to flee from us. Hallelujah. Let me tell you today, you've got a weapon in your hand called the word of God. You've got the blood of the lamb applied over your life. You've got the word of your testimony that will make you an overcomer. You're not going under, you're going over because you are an overcomer. You're a child of the living God. Hallelujah. Whew. That's the hope of the gospel. He redeemed us. Secondly, the hope of the gospel that we have heard is that he reconciled us. He reconciled us. Look at verse 21. And you, everybody say you. 
Yeah, point your, point your finger at the person next to you and say, you, 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 you. And you who were once, uh-oh, alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless. Thank you, Jesus. And above reproach before him. The word reconciled, catch this, friends. It means to make things right between two parties who were once enemies. I know nobody wants to talk about this anymore. Very few preachers like to preach this. But can I tell you today that you weren't just uh, non-religious before you came to Christ. You weren't just a non-believer before you came to Christ. You weren't just a a non-churchgoer before you came to Christ. Let me tell you what you were. You were an enemy of God. You were cut off. The Bible gives us all kinds of phrases, enemies of the cross. The Bible says we were far away from God. We weren't just religious. We weren't just going to church. We weren't just good people trying to do better. We were separated from his presence, cut off from the household of faith. The wrath of God was abiding on us. Wow. Let that sink in, friend. You were an enemy of God. But when we submitted ourselves to Jesus as Savior and Lord and surrendered to him, the word tells us we were reconciled. We were forgiven. We were made right with God, just as God designed from the Garden of Eden, from the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve fell to sin in the garden, we were lost. Humanity was lost. We had become enemies of a holy God, but because of the boss, because of his sacrifice on the cross, we have the opportunity and the access to become children of the most high God because Jesus reconciled all things by his blood. Hallelujah. Oh, that gets me excited today. Glory to God. Last of all, real quick. He's not only the boss of his creation, the boss of the church and the boss of his children. But one day, we will recognize him as the boss of all nations. Think about it. I I know, I know, I know, I know. We, We live in a world today where most nations, they won't even recognize him as Savior. They, they, They don't even recognize his kingship. In fact, they mock him. They, they mock us. They laugh at him. They laugh at us. They deny his existence. Ah, but they forget one thing. Mm. They forget what the apostle Paul, or I'm sorry, the apostle John saw in his vision on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation. Let me read it for you just to remind you and give you hope today. Here's what it says. John says, I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. (laughs) I'm looking forward to the white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen white and pure were following him on white Horses, that's us, that's like us. We're gonna be following him. We're gonna have white horses. Come on now, 
Do you believe this word? <laughs> From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Don't you be moved by what you see in the nations. Don't you be moved by what you see on the news. The boss is is in charge. Hallelujah. Come on, stand up and give him a praise today. Glory to God. Come on. Is he worthy of praise? Well, shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's the boss. All over the building today, bow your heads, close your eyes. No one looking around. Here's the question He is the boss. He is. Now, is he your boss? Hey, who's calling the shots in your life? Is he Lord? Have you been listening to split lips so much that you can't even hear his voice? Jesus is Lord. Now he's asking you and I to participate and cooperate with his lordship. You can't make him Lord. He is Lord. You've got to cooperate with him and participate with his lordship. Some of you in this building today, you've never made Jesus the savior of your life. You've never received forgiveness of sins. You're an enemy of God. You and God are at war and you struggle. That's why you're struggling. That's why right now you feel conviction. Conviction's a good thing. By the way, so is guilt. Guilt is to our spirit what pain is to our body. It lets us know something's wrong. I can tell you how to get rid of that guilt. Surrender. Say, Jesus, I need you to be my savior and forgive me. I don't want to be at war with you because you'll win every time. You're the boss. There's, some, there's so many others of you today. The Lord told me to say this. So many of, the, of you today, you've received Jesus as savior. You've got fire insurance. Truth is, you're probably going to go to heaven because you said, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior and my Lord. And when you did that, God justified you and he forgave you of your sin. You're right with God. But can I tell you, there are many of you today, you have never opened wide your heart to participate in the Lordship of Jesus Christ over your life. You're still living your own life. You're still calling your own shots. You're playing games with God. I'm telling you, church, God is getting us ready. I'm talking about us, this local church. God's getting us ready for an outpouring of his spirit such as we have never seen. But until that time comes, we've got to submit to the lordship of Jesus in our life. I feel this in my gut so strong this morning. I want everybody in this house today, you would say, I've never received Jesus as Savior. I've never received the forgiveness of sins. Or I've never opened my life. Yes, I received Jesus as Savior, but I've never really submitted to his lordship in my life. I want you to step out of your seat and jump, get to this altar as quick as you can. And I want to lead you in a prayer that will change your life. Do it right now. One, two, three. Come on, step out right where you're at right now. Jesus, be the Lord. I'm tired of playing the games.
I'm tired of struggling and being at war with you, God. I need you to be Lord of my life. Come on, step out. Don't be ashamed and don't be afraid. You're among friends. Come on, do it. Do it now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm telling you, friend, if you can't step out among believers today, I know you'll never step out in this crazy world that we're living in. It's part of the issue. Who'll be the first to take the step? Yes. Yes. Declare it. Come on, Lincoln, declare it. Your name is the highest. Your name it's the greatest. greatest. Your name stands above them all. Preeminent Christ. Above all thrones. Yes, Lord. All power. Your name stands above them all. Sing it again. Say your name. Declare it, church. Your name stands above the All thrones and dominions, all, all power and positions. Your name stands above the And the angels cry. And the angels cry. Oh, creation. Listen, 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 listen. This is what revival looks like. You say, well, I, I don't see anybody being slain in the spirit. Forget that junk. This is what revival looks like. An evil... An evil and wicked generation seeks for signs and wonders. Let that sink in. You say, well, pastor, aren't we supposed to believe? Oh, absolutely. I believe that wherever I go, signs and wonders follow the preaching of the word. But I'm not seeking signs and wonders. I think, here's what I personally think, if the church would would quit seeking signs and wonders, we might actually have signs and wonders. Why? Because I'm not seeking signs and wonders, I'm seeking Him. I'm not seeking gifts, I'm seeking the giver of gifts. We gotta get, we got to get some things right. So many people are playing games with God. And I'm telling you, there's a purging fire coming into the body of Christ. It's already here. God's getting us cleaned up inside and out. And he is going to pour his spirit out in unusual, in uncommon ways. We've got to get our sails set and be ready. I do not want to be a cloud without rain. I don't want to look the part. I want to be the part. 
so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over everybody in this house today. I sure hope that your word has offended us. I sure hope it has. I hope we walk away offended and mad because your spirit convicted us that we'll so offended that we'll actually do something about our miserable lives and that we'll allow you to be Lord of our lives and Lord of the church. Offend us, God, at any cost so that we can be right with you and so that you can work in our lives. Oh, Jesus, we give you praise. You are the Lord. You're the boss. Hallelujah. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the message today. And before you leave, make sure you go to our YouTube page and subscribe and check out our website. New Life exists to love God and lead people to live a better story. So whether you're going to continue to listen to us online or come see us in person, we hope to see you again real soon.